Hello world, my name is Mitch Schultz and welcome back to the Way of the Psychonauts community screenings. I'm joined by director and producer Susan hesch -Loger. Hi Susan. Hey Matt, or Mitch, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Matt is our disembodied voice who are, is our social media person. So hey, sorry. hey, hey, I'm here too. What's hey, good? Good, <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, well, anyway, Mitch, it's today is our um, Q&A with uh, Michael Murphy, and uh, we're going to be screening his pre-recorded interview first. And um, so Michael Murphy is the co-founder of the Esalen Institute with Dick Price. And this was a place and still is a place where deep exploration of the human psyche is, is possible. And um, Rick Tarnas who was the program director there for about 10 years, described it as a womb environment where uh, new ideas had the, the nurturing and the support they needed to fully form and go out into the world. And Rupert Sheldrake um, described it also as a place where you could have new ideas without being um, diminished or dismissed or criticized. And so it was a, an amazing opportunity for people to brainstorm together and uh, share different perspectives and come forward with new ideas. So it was really, um, and still is an amazing place. So I'm thrilled to be sharing our interview with you. Uh, Michael provides some wonderful history of Esalen and how it came to be what it is. And also um, he will be joining us afterwards for a Q&A. So I'll pass it over to Mitch and he will um, take it from there. Yes, very excited to have Michael Murphy on today. The, uh, the history of Esalen and what it has served is, has just been amazing. So, all right. Well, in this video and interview, Michael Murphy covers historic information about the Esalen Institute and the thinking behind its formation, providing a place where an ex expanded understanding of human project might be explored. Stan's background in psychology and psychedelics made him a perfect scholar for Esalen in the 19, late 1960s, while his month-long workshops invited a broad scope of experts in fields ranging from spiritual traditions to the new sciences. Great anecdotes about Esalen's history and its influence on the consciousness movement. So without further ado, Michael Murphy. Well, I had grown up on this property on weekends and summers. It was our dacha, our getaway place and my grandfather had bought it. It was actually two miles of Big Sur coast. It's been gerrymandered up now and he had wanted to build a spa. He was a doctor. He had created two hospitals, etc. Um, but uh, the war came along. The highway um, uh, really didn't reach uh, Esalen until 1935 and then opened up and down the coast in 1938. And then Pearl Harbor, the war, everything on the coast was shut down. And then after the war, my grandfather died. And it became uh, an outpost of the um, creative edge of the Bohemian community out here in Central California. Henry Miller had moved down there. Um, uh, and then um, my grandmother hired Hunter Thompson to be the caretaker. Uh, but um, so the place was um, uh, outlaw country, but filled with uh, all sorts of interesting people. So when Esalen started, it got a natural lift from this community that was down there. You could call it Bohemian. It was not quite beatnik uh, and certainly not hippie at that stage. Um, so... Um, we launched in uh, that atmosphere after a very tumultuous start uh, when um, my grandmother let me fulfill a dream I had uh, to create this place. But she had refused because she, as she told everyone, I would give it immediately to the Hindus, she felt, because I was inspired by a vision of heaven and earth, uh, let's call it evolutionary panentheism. It was really a, um, a vision of things um, that I had been inspired to when I was an undergraduate at Stanford uh, years earlier. Um, she had said, no, Michael can't be allowed, but um, a huge 
fight started there one day between Hunter Thompson and the gay community that haunted those baths on weekends. Uh, and the, uh, they tried to kill Hunter, and he fought his way free. And there was a lot of gunfire, believe it or not. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, my father, who was my grandmother's consigliere, she, he was a lawyer, uh, said, Vinny, Vinny, if we don't give it uh, to Michael, we're all going to be in jail together. So I, in the midst of this tumult, uh, Dick Price and I got to take the property over uh, for this uh, dream that I'd been nurturing for a few years. What was the dream? Well, it was, all right, there are a lot of ways to um, tell the story. Uh, I think it's important to say, first of all, what it was not. It was never an idea uh, to make an ashram, nor a commune. So these communes were starting to spring up then, but they really started to spring up. We never had that idea, although a number of people who came to work on our staff demanded a commune of sorts, and that was a kind of a struggle in the early years, defining what it really was. So what was it? Um, it wasn't merely a seminar center either, um, which there had always been seminar centers, but it was a, um, a place for uh, exploration into the undiscovered countries that uh, both Dick and I had been inspired to explore. And um, in our mind, it was to explore uh, first, um, kind of conceptually, in conversation. So it became an ongoing, brokered, and curated conversation between uh, everybody's book that I had read. I, I essentially built the program. Dick ran the inn. Um, so if, uh, Aldous Huxley, Abraham Maslow, Paul Tillich, Arnold Toynbee, the list goes on and on and on. It was um, a mustering of uh, these people that I and Dick felt were glimpsing and starting to define a new culture, which would involve both science and religion, both East and West, uh, body, mind, heart, and soul. Uh, the idea being that human nature um, is much more than our parents told us, or our ministers, or our, God forbid, our psychiatrists or psychologists. Um, so uh, that conversation started from the very beginning with uh, weekend seminars and then five-day conferences and so forth. But almost immediately, this is not generally appreciated, uh, we started invitational conferences, not open to the general public, to go after particular avenues of e exploration that were opening up. Um, and then uh, the third was that we uh, spun off, well, at least five other institutes were spun out of Esalen with grants from the Ford Foundation, NIH, and all of this. That, th th this started to happen in the second year we were, these things were going, already by 63. And so you could say there was um, these different venues uh, to get this done, but I wouldn't call it a small college, but uh, if you, you had to describe it as anything, it, it was an institute, um, sui generis, uh, unique. And it, it's a mistake for historians to try to pin us down with a thing, an ashram or a commune or, um, uh, or anything like that. It is what it is. It's Esalen Institute. So there it was. And um, when I met Stan, who uh, I met first in 65, he was there with Virginia Satir, the famous um, uh, and brilliant and um, really a breakthrough uh, family therapist would be one way to say it, but it was group dynamics but she had what William James called the mystic germ in her. She didn't talk that language, but it was there. And in any case, she was quite a, uh, quite a woman, and she appeared down there with Stan in 1965, and he was probably the best-looking man in the human potential movement. I mean, he was as good-looking as, uh, as Richard Burton. And with Virginia, it was quite stunning. 
and Czechoslovakia. And um, this astonishing story of doing research with LSD in Prague. And he was one of the first. We started to hear a lot about what was going on in East Europe and Russia in those early years. Um, so they were a, a, a kind of stunning couple, and he was stunning. But then um, he returned, I believe, at that point to Prague, and then eventually we heard he was back at Johns Hopkins doing research. So we heard about him quite a bit. <clears throat> but then I started to meet him again um, in various venues, and he was a rising star over here. And then um, sometime, 72 or 73, uh, I um, met him when he was um, um, with Joan Halifax uh, back in New York at the home of Robert Schwartz, a friend of ours. And um, again, he was so stunning. And for me, um, I, in running this, this Esalen Institute, um, more often, an amazing number of times, there would be these incredible synchronicities. And I had um, kept a journal of um, coincidences. Starting actually in 62, I kept this journal. And um, it was as if uh, I was um, co-directing the enterprise with the spirits. And, um, you know, uh, I've always remained agnostic about the spirits, but uh, it was as if. And with him, with Stan, so many things lined up. It was, I have to say, it was my instinct as a, as a director and producer of this ongoing theater at Esalen. He was perfect, a just intuitive take. And of course, uh, we had uh, been right in the middle of um, a lot of experimentation with psychedelics. Aldous Huxley uh, gave me my first LSD trip. By then, uh, Tim Leary and Dick Alpert took me on another trip, and um, so I had a lot of good opportunities. And although psychedelics were not my ally, I only had eight trips, and they got worse and worse. Um, but um, um, partly through the, those trips, and then we're going on at Esalen, um, um, Stan represented not only another doorway into this, but also sobriety. I mean, he actually thought about it. He didn't just proclaim, like Tim Leary. Tim pretended to think about it, but he just proclaimed a vision of um, taking LSD every Sunday. If it's good, just have more of it. And we um, saw disaster after disaster during the 60s, uh, before Stan ever came to Esalen, that it just didn't work taking it promiscuously. Uh, so Stan's combination of uh, research and his, um, the sheer uh, beauty of his personality and everything about him, I thought, wow, you know, if I was running a movie studio, uh, this is a star. And so, make a long story short, uh, Bob Schwartz gave us some money and Esalen provided a, a beautiful house on a cliff there and uh, with a view, and uh, off we went. And he became, um, I would say, the leading force in our overall programming uh, for most of the years he was there, from 73, I guess, to 87. Um, a typical venue would be a month-long program um, and I think he, every single year he was there, he did at least two, occasionally three. So let's say he did 30 of these meetings. Now, it was an all-star lineup that was coming year after year through him. Now, we'd already had an awful lot of very famous people coming through Esalen, and, um, but he, I would say, would be the primary um, programming force on the Big Sur property. By then, we had a center in San Francisco as well, and we had projects in other part of the world, and um, so we were, you know, we had quite a few activities. But he certainly um, uh, was there, and he um, 
marvelously represented uh, um, our aspirations to join um, conversation with research and with practice. And in the early years, he was um, giving uh, trips with people, sitting trips. And then as time went on, and there were more and more strictures uh, against uh, psychedelic trips, he uh, invented holotropic breathing and um, came to broker uh, the spiritual emergency work um, for which he's famous with uh, his, um, his wife, uh, Christina. Um, but all of that evolved. So while he was at Esalen, he wrote a number of books. Uh, he uh, continued his research, I would say. He invented holotropic breathing and he helped bro broker the whole spiritual emergency uh, network which uh, was a force out there in the culture. So um, I'm very proud of the fact that we got to support his work. Um, and for me, uh, he represents what has been sorely lacking, which is the long through line, a work over decades. Because in this wild, meandering exploration of the further reaches of human nature, particularly in the 60s, but even in the long sobering up of the 70s, and then all the cults, and the wild fads, and the mistakes. It's a, it's a wild, uh, often undisciplined learning community that doesn't have a, a clear organization. It's a big work in progress, and he's been one of the mainstays. And, clear, um, um, well, a worker in the vineyards who's persevered, and let's say in Psychedelics Themselves, uh, this book by Michael Polian um, is, um, you know, gives a nice recognition of Esalen and of course Stan, and he again has provided a, a through line in theory. I mean, his theory, of course, will have to be tested over time. There's theories. Uh, so um, he's been able to provide a huge body of empirical lore. I mean, what comes up in these trips and his keeping track of that all in the spirit of science. And then I'd say the beginning of a taxonomy. You know, in the life sciences and the physical sciences, both you start with natural history. You collect all this, whether it's... Um, rocks or animal specimens or whatever, and then pretty soon you can see patterns that connect, and you get a taxonomy, so then you get, hopefully, out of all that theory. So he represents that kind of progression. And um, I'm very, very proud of the fact that we could help him along his great way. All right, you know, Esalen now, uh, through the years, has evolved quite a bit. Um, when we uh, began in the early... 60s, just to give you an example, um, uh, the um, young uh, presidents of America with white, uh, what is it called, the young, young presidents, decided to have a conference there. This was, it would be in the mid-60s. So they came in a great bus with a bar in the bus. Uh, and they landed in our then uh, parking lot um, and uh, parked. And we had gathered, and it uh, in those days, there would be uh, men with no shirt on and a headband and a feather. This is the mid-60s. Um, the, the hippie world had started to de uh, descend on us um, against our wishes. It was hard for us to control the grounds in those years. Um, uh, and so the, the young presidents of America were peering out from the bus, and it occurred to me, um, I had the image of the Dutch landing in Manhattan, and we were the, uh, the Indians ashore. So finally, I, n nobody emerged from the bus. So I approached, and I could see they were peering out. And I felt like, well, maybe they wanted some wampum from one of, the, <laughs> one of the natives. So the door opened. I said, well, come ashore. Welcome ashore. I said, uh, what's up? They said, we're thinking about it. We're thinking about it. So anyway. Um, so some time passed, 
And uh, as people gathered in the parking lot, it became more and more a motley crew. You had to have been there to see it. It was the um, high 60s. Probably a good number of the people were stoned. Um, one can tell when they're in that condition. Um, there was no outright nudity in the parking lot, but a lot of the men didn't have any shirts on it, whatever. So the big bus managed to turn and drive up without anyone coming ashore. Now, that's, that, this is just one uh, example of how uh, wild it can get. Um, at one, one day, for example, this is in the very early 60s, Arnold Toynbee came, and we paid him $100 to come and uh, lecture on the, uh, uh, the greatest event of the 20th century. He had proclaimed the coming of Buddhism to the West. So my parents um, had organized uh, a reception down in the big house. So everybody, and the, the men were neckties, and it was, it was kind of the Monterey Peninsula crowd and my family's friends and 30 people like this and listening to Mr. Toynbee and then having, you know, uh, cocktails afterwards and all very, um, very, a lot of decor and meanwhile, on the other side of the property, Allen Ginsberg was uh, lecturing, and there were actually people completely in the nude uh, over there. Um, so these two going on at the same time, and uh, uh, my cousin and her husband at this point were helping run the place. It was, um, and they were going back and forth saying, these are two wild communities. Well, I would say that was a kind of a, a premonition of things to come. These divergence of groups with radically different sensibilities, often in right in close juxtaposition. So um, uh, the grounds were always full of surprises in the 60s. And then suddenly a quiet would fall and at night uh, the, the, the dining room would become beautiful with candlelight and um, really stunningly beautiful. And we had the deck out there and looking at the view and everything, and so suddenly it would change. And um, you could, um, one, um, anyway, a New Yorker did a profile on me and the Calvin Tompkins' wife said, you know, this place is like a gorgeous woman who when she's dressed up is just stunningly beautiful and when she's not, is kind of ugly. This is what she said, just the turnaround. And um, uh, it was, um, too rich for anybody with any kind of aesthetic judgment. There were so many dress styles and, and codes of behavior. And I'm talking in the 60s now. And Fritz Perls, who really had a wicked genius of uh, insight. You know, the Siddhis in the Indian yoga systems of being a, or in the, uh, the Catholic, reading hearts. And he could look into you and see things uncanny. But he would then come and tell you what he saw and often it was not nice. Um, so he was walking around and et cetera. But as the place evolved, it started to um, get a little more harmony, let's put it, people learning. And by the time Stan got there in 1973 and four, and um, um, when you were there, Rick, um, it was shifting already. And so, it depends when you say what it was it like. You'd have to say what season. I mean, all the seasons of Esalen. And it's gradually, it has, uh, I would say, sobered up, uh, become um, having, I, I, I like to say it has its own unique elegance. So it's not uh, uptight, um, but it's not the same as it was then. You don't see nudity on the grounds anymore. It's uh, right away there you know, disciplined if anybody try, people don't even try anymore. And um, the kind of, um, it was a place of many venial sins uh, and um, bad behavior that, um, uh, that's changed a lot. Uh, so physically, you know, it's, um, one of the geniuses of that property is it has so many sight lines so people would get down there to do these um, big um, 
master plans. We've done about four or five master plans. And so they uh, know how to get sight lines. And so we rebuilt the lodge to get three or four new sight lines so you can see down the coast. And um, then it um, also has a lot of microclimates. Uh, people who've studied it, um, dozens, 10 degree differences at, at different parts of the property. And uh, so it can be an extraordinarily moody place. And it reinforces people's moods. It has a psychedelic element just in and of itself. And uh, the universal testimony we've gotten, uh, 57 years of programs, I mean, we've done, you know, we've done, you know, more than 20,000 programs um, and 15,000 people a year. So we get a lot of testimony. And leaders constantly say they get results in these groups that they don't get at, in a hotel or even at a conventional seminar center like Silomar. Um, so it's, uh, it's moody and it, um, it, it, um, it's contagious. The place is contagious. Um, and then I would say it, um, it catalyzes the sort of thing we wanted to talk about, namely that human nature is complex. And um, we live in a palace of a thousand rooms and we only inhabit 10 of the thousand rooms. So that's a, it can double the number of rooms. Just to add one room is a turn on in, your, in this nature we inhabit. So it has that catalytic power. And of course, Stan was totally at ease in all this. I mean, he was, you know, I, I've never seen him balk at an adventure of consciousness. He doesn't balk. He's very calm, you know, very centered. And uh, he's kind of built for such adventure. I would say, naturally. And um, so that's the way it was and is. But ever evolving down there, it really is. People who come back after 10 or 15 years, they can't believe it, the changes. And not just in the, some of the buildings, because we're always, we're always working on the place physically. But um, the, um, the movements of the Geist, you know, the Geist evolves and I was interviewed in Russia on this last trip, and uh, this marvelous guy, NPR is doing a big two-hour thing on our track two diplomacy with Russia. And he says, how do you guys manage to surf the geist decade after? It was a nice phrase, you know. And so, the, so it's an evolving creature. And um, anyway, those are some impressions. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I uh, for me, you know, having grown up there, and uh, so as a kid, um, going down there, you know, that air is uh, among the cleanest air in the world, 10,000 miles of air conditioning across the Pacific, and then 30 miles on the other side over to uh, the valley, Salinas Valley, so there's not any blowback. So your lungs right away get that, plus those breaking waves, I mean, those thundering rollers coming right in against the cliffs, sitting on those cliffs, and um, so the negative ions. Uh, and then you have the three waters, you know, you wonder about that, the mineral water the, and, and the um, other two. And that was why my grandfather bought the property in 1910, a spa, that, that, uh, very rare, that the, the three, the big freshwater stream, salt water and mineral water. So God knows, I mean, these negative ions. And then, um, um, you know, hard to know what these um, morphogenetic fields or whatever, but a lot of it is the anticipation with which people come. Because first of all, you have to drive a long way. It isn't a drop-in place. It takes some doing. So that has made it a kind of a pilgrimage. And we are all wired for pilgrimage. I mean, that's what this life is. In many ways, it's a pilgrimage. So here you have a little enactment. Uh, and many people are um, nervous, some scared when they get there for all the different reasons. And even old timers, their blood's up when they get there. And that anticipation provides energy. So you come in with your own tailwinds. And... Um, and you have to come through your fears. So I think 
there's a um, kind of a, ba a bravery quotient for people who come there, really. Timid folks don't. Uh, it, and if they are naturally timid or retiring, um, for them to have broken through that to come, uh, that's, that's a something. In the summer that we were d deciding for this, Gerald Hurd, Aldous Suxley's great uh, uh, co you know, explorer, had come from, he was Irish, but they'd both come over here in the 30, late 30s with the Vedanta Society and all. So um, uh, Gerald said to Dick and I uh, there that his theory was that the continent, as it pushes, it's like a sled, because as you know, the rock turns up like this. So when you look down that coast, it's not segmented this way. It's this way, often. Why? Because it's the tectonic plates pushing as it moves. So he said, unconsciously, everyone will feel that they're pushing across into that ocean. Now, that's a highly speculative and very Irish. He was, uh, he was almost too Irish, but he, uh, everything was highly embellished, you know, with him. But you wonder, I mean, something geological could be in play, but there's no doubt about it. People do uh, have a, typically, have a little extra something when they're down there. And in the early days, when um, before Esalen, way back, um, the first baths that my grandfather had built there, you, you see the springs, there were the big yellow springs, uh, the rocks, uh, sulfur, and then the gray ones, uh, arsenic. And he claimed to have cured a couple of syphilitics down there because, you know, that was the only cure way back was arsenic. And then the white ones, uh, soda, and the red ones, you know, copper and blue, uh, I mean, all, all these colorful, and if you go down on the beach, nobody does this and walks down to the end of the property. That's so strenuous to get down on those rocks. You see this water sprouting up out of the ground and coming out of the cliffs. Uh, and they measured in those days 600 gallons a minute of this hot water coming at 130 degrees. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of hot water. When we rebuilt those baths, those stanchions go down 40 feet. You couldn't see these guys who were down there 40 feet with the oxygen masks, putting them into the rock. If, I mean, you know, we, when the place collapsed in 1998, uh, if we were going to have them there, we had to go all out and put those stanchions in. And then we were hitting the water there. That's, it's quasi-volcanic. So who knows, what is, does that do? So there it is. Yeah. Who shows up? Michael Harner you know, 1964, brought a graduate student, promising graduate student named Carlos Castaneda. And so we had a gathering, Claudio Naranjo, who's one of the great, great guys in the early days of Esalen, and um, Mike Harner, um, Bessie Parrish, the famous shaman lady. She weighed about 350 pounds, tremendous presence, you know. Um, Fritz Perls. Um, and others, and this unknown graduate student, Carlos Castaneda, who and was being filmed for the NPR station up here. I, um, so um, Carlos absolutely, totally stole the show away from all these other people just by the sheer personality. He never sat in a chair. He sat, sat on the floor telling these stories about Don Juan, 1964, and at one point, so infuriated Fritz Perls that he reached down and slapped, slapped uh, Carlos. He said, you are leading this astray. He, he had declared war on all my mystical and occult tendencies, Fritz said. And he would send his CS. So this was the first paradigm war within Esla between, you know, he was a committed atheist like Abe. But, Abe, but I came to call all those guys crypto-mystics. But see, they were of a generation where, you know, you couldn't, uh, you're atheists. And he couldn't stand this thing. Of, uh, but anyway, there was this a charming character. So we didn't, he left, and then some years passed. And um, uh, I heard that he'd actually come up a couple of times. Uh, this was after I'd moved to San Francisco and before you were there. And he, to help write a book. 
And my God, he brought this book up to me in 1969, The Teachings of Don Juan, and it was exactly the stories he told. But I, I didn't read it, and uh, I, I didn't think another thing about it. It wasn't, didn't hit me in my, you know, right in the zone. So um, a year later, he was on the cover of Time Magazine. I couldn't believe it. He just took off. And, um, and then the stories started to morph, and it got more and more embellished. And it's the general belief of those very close to him that that first book was the most authentic, and then he embellished it more and more. So he, he should have just told the world he was a wonderful, magical, realist novelist. He would have been celebrated. But he came quite bitter toward the end of his life that his, quote, anthropology was never fully appreciated by the Academy. Well, the problem, of course, it wasn't anthropology. It was a work of the imagination built on whoever Don Juan was. And there's still a huge debate, really, among the smartest people I know, exactly who Don Juan might have been. The latest I heard is that he was probably a Gurdjieffian. But who knows? I mean, maybe he was a brujo. And Do you remember what Mike Harmer's view was? Uh, you know, um, Mike was so extraordinarily complex himself, I, I actually don't know what his settled view was. Yeah. Uh, I heard Mike, who had one of the greatest wits and sense of humors, I mean, and he could make light of things, so I don't know what Mike finally, so I think it'll be a mystery. Yeah. I think we might have that in the conversation between Sam and Mike. Oh, good. And yeah. that, that's how I knew that Oh, you have a conversation between the two of them? Yeah, between my How would you get that? Oh, she's been doing this for two or three for years. Four years. Four years. Oh, Susan, you're lucky yeah. to have that. Yeah. Oof, that's a treasure. Yeah. That's a treasure. Yeah, because they were both articulate. Yeah. You know, what you're doing, no matter what becomes of it, this, oh. see, that's the tragedy. I mean, we have, there's a lot of stuff floating around at uh, Esalen. It's just an unbelievable but we've just never had the time, energy, and money to curate it. So it's all hiding out in different, but, uh, and there was a movie made of that event, and it was um, lost. It was a, a movie made for um, KQED. Yeah, it was lost. Of, of, can you imagine that? Carlos being slapped by Fritz. Wouldn't you love to have that one? <laughs> and you know, I have a, one memory. Everybody has a different memory of, of Carlos's response, but he, he, uh, uh, he, he, it was something to the effect he turned around completely unfazed and looked at him. He says, "You're very poorly behaved," something like that. I mean, I mean he's unflapped. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, Fritz. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting theory. But he was analyzed by Reich, Wilhelm Reich. And so he definitely, uh, and he, he didn't get out until 37, 38. And so he saw it in all its horrors. Um, but um, no, I think it was something of that whole generation of, of uh, the, there were so many of them um, that came to us, and I used to call it the Moses complex. You know, Moses, could, he led them to the, but he, come, uh, to the um, yeah. Promised Land, but he couldn't go in. Gregory so was like that. Yes, was. Gregory was like that. Uh, any number. So, you know, talk about it and flirt with it. But the minute you see anything raw, back instinctively away. Mm -hmm. So this is very true of a lot of those guys at that age. Yeah. But, you know, one story I could tell that might be apropos, I don't know, about Fritz and I, about this thing of... A, um, refusing the language of the mystical. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's a lot of stories I could tell on that one, but once uh, he and I were, you know, working, you know, it was a five-day conference over in the big house. So he was had me kind of like a hot seat doing what he called his continuum of awareness because Fritz Perls had a number of these exercises that came out of his learnings along the way. And... Um, so it was um, just, it was kind of like Satipatthana uh, right now. What are you feeling? What's up right now? 
So um, we were doing this, and then uh, when I would get to it, I'd wander off, he'd say, no, no, now you're in the delicatessen. I remember him saying, you're just naming. He says, I want you to stay, right? So sometime, we, I, maybe, I don't know, it was less than 15 minutes, uh, 12, 15 minutes, he took my hands, he said, he looked at me, you know, those big eyes, you know, he could be melt right in front of you, although he could be intimidating. And uh, he says, I think that's enough. And he just looked at me like that, and I said, well, great. So I went and sat down, and um, I looked out to the water, and everything was no longer blue, it was white, and the crests were blue. It was, it was really a dramatic reversal of figure ground. And then went over to lunch, and there was an abstract expression list, about 20 paintings around on the walls. And I said, who's been in here changing the paintings around? Everybody said, Nobody's. But everything had reversed on that. I was really stoned. And a little later, uh, uh, Dick comes up and he said, Mike, you won't believe this, but Fritz just told me the reason he stopped is that he was having a major Satori experience. I mean, isn't that a, and I was in this state too. But isn't that something? Yeah. And he would, at the next minute, tell you, meditation is neither shitting nor getting off the pot. That's, that was his line. And there he was now, having a Satori, and he stopped it. Yeah. You see, so he was right. complex. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I could oh, tell you yeah. some other experiences like that, because he would experiment with psychedelics, and I found him once. Actually, Bernie and I found him once in his room in a state that he was deeply stoned, but in, in the best way. Dick, you know, Dick did not come to any seminars the first three years. He, he was re still recovering. He really was. So I, you know, I invited the people. They came. They got to know me. And, you know, we didn't have as many as we do now. So that's what I did until I moved to San Francisco. Um, but... Um, uh, so, but when Dick started in, he then kind of bonded with Fritz. I would say in 66, particularly, but beginning in 65. At first, Dick and Fritz didn't get along at all because they, Dick didn't, Dick had a temper and he didn't take shit off anyone and Fritz was the way he was and et cetera. But once they bonded, um, so Dick's involvement and then Fritz's, I would say that was the shaping force for the manners, for the language, and for a lot of the attitudes. And it's taken us a long time to get over the worst part of that. Um, and, you know, I've become more and more critical of it the more, the older I get. And, of course, uh, Gordon Wheeler, who's now the president of Vessel, you know, which is... You know, we don't have an executive director anymore. We decided we don't need one and shouldn't have one. So, you know, Jeff is a wonderful chairman and et cetera. But uh, Gordon, more than anyone, has led the, the evolution and reform of Gestalt therapy. The, the APA, two years ago, asked him to do the definitive little booklet they have on statements. So, and he, it's, you know, the summary is it's from the me to the we. I mean, he brought Gestalt into a more relational mm -hmm. thing. So in terms of your critique... I the think. critique is that, um, so the, um, see, the, the moods of Esalen are not just physical. I mean, they're intellectual and they're in terms of attitude, they're attitudinal, and their manners, how we are with each other on a, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, that, it, and that was, that got rough yeah. down there and very challenging. Um, now... You'd have to say, eventually, Schutz had a huge influence. Well, Schutz, and he and Fritz were, they had their own paradigm war going. So the place was always contentious. But we welcomed it, Dick and I. I mean, we wanted it to be, you know, just as nasty as a university. You know how nasty they get. I mean, this one versus this one. Not nasty, and I mean, people aren't going around and hitting each other or anything like that. But challenge. There was always a lot of challenge. Uh, everything now is so much more, is so much warmer. Yeah. I mean, it, the difference between the '60s and now is just fantastic, and uh, there's no way of going back to that. Right. 
And one of the things I think we really have to teach is the glamorization of the 60s is a crock. I mean, it was great for young, all of us young people breaking into the new, the wonder of it and the power of it, and then the fact that we could have a container there. But one of the things we have to appreciate is, first of all, my family, but also me, with the dealing with the, the law, you know, dealing with the DEA. You know, I went up and met the head of the DEA for Northern California in 64, and this wonderful guy uh, about drugs. And he lectured me on the Fourth Amendment. He says, you can't go into anybody's room because the Fourth Amendment guarantees the right to be in a hotel room. That's why we had the revolution. The British could just come in and habeas corpus, no, you know, just haul you out. So you can't, but your responsibility is to keep the dealers off the grounds. So anyway, we were doing that all the time. Fritz really thought, I, I graduated in his estimation when I took the lead on that one. That was 64. And, uh, but also then with the, um, you know, uh, with the uh, FBI, not only the DEA, but um, and we got to know when they would be around. Well, I'll tell you, Susan, this story has not yet been told. George Leonard was very important to me and to Eslin, and he was the West Coast editor of Look Magazine. And he, um, okay, the, the Nixon administration tried to get rid of him from Look, and, uh, and uh, as they said, this, it's, we're, we don't care about your Vietnam stance, it's your lifestyle, what you're doing to American culture. And they had taken a, that upon themselves. Then they knew, I mean, Dan Ellsberg was taking peyote in the baths with fat marks while he was going through his change that led to the Pentagon Papers. So the, the weird story that's never been told is, so then these stories, they, you know, the Charles Manson, that we had trained Charles Manson. But it was the way those stories were spread and when and how immediately. Uh, now this is, this would take a, we don't want to talk about it now, but the fact, the way we handle that with our lawyers. So, uh, you know, they took us on and they're out. Nixon's sight. Because uh, we turned over every table they came. But uh, it's a combat zone. I mean, our, there, there's, these are paradigm wars. And if you don't have tough lawyers, and if you don't have willing to go to the mat and take someone on when it's time, not that you want to, you have to for your survival. But we've won every war we have. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the way the Psychonauts community screenings. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed Michael Murphy's interview with Susan, and that it's inspired some uh, questions and hopefully some thought uh, for the Q&A that we're getting ready to have. Uh, prior to jumping in, though, I think I'll let Susan introduce Michael Murphy. Yes. So it is my pleasure to share with, with you Michael Murphy's biography. He is the co-founder and chairman emeritus of the board of the Esalen Institute and the author of both fiction and nonfiction books that explore evidence for meta-normal capacities in human beings, including Golf in the Kingdom and the Future of the Body. He is the director of Esalen's think tank, Center for Theory Research. And during his 50-year involvement at the human, in the human potential movement, he and his work have been profiled in The New Yorker, and featured in many magazines and journals worldwide. A graduate of Stanford University, he was one of the first Americans to live at the Sri Aurobindo Ashram in Pondicherry, India in the mid 1950s. In the 1980s, Murphy helped start a successful Soviet American exchange program, which was a premier diplomacy vehicle for citizen to citizen Russian American relations. Boris Yeltsin's first visit to America in 1989 was initiated by Esalen. His other books include The Life We Are Given, co-authored with George Leonard, The Kingdom of Shiva's Irons, Jacob Adabet, An End to Ordinary History, In the Zone, Transcendent Experience in Sports, which was co-authored with Rhea White, and The Physical and Psychological Effects of Meditation. So welcome, Michael. What a Good joy to be here, Susan. Hi. Hello Hi. again. Thanks for joining us, Michael. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. So, well, Susan, I'll do, let, you, do you want me to jump in first or do you want to? Well, okay, I'll jump in. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. So based on the situation that humanity is currently facing, um, the ecosystem destruction, you know, all these social and racial injustice, global pandemic, in our conversation prior to coming into this, 
um, you mentioned this challenge, and I'll use your words, of um, negotiating community while developing as individuals. And, and that, that this was really, uh, you know, a challenge that, that's facing us pretty powerfully in this moment. Um, would you talk about that, please? Yeah, well, uh, individuation. Uh, let's think Jung. Uh, let's think uh, Abraham Maslow. Um, the fuller development of the individual. Uh, this has been a long, long process. Uh, it goes back, we don't know how far uh, into our past, but certainly thousands of years. Um, uh, and it has accelerated in modern times. Um, and certainly since um, the French Enlightenment, uh, you've had an explosive acceleration, I would say, in the American Revolution, the French Revolution, um, the advent of um, democratic republics around the world, um, the uh, struggle with tyrants, um, with um, kings and dictators, uh, the attempt to build uh, out large parts of the world, um, let's say the United States, 3,000 miles across, um, governed in a system that we see, we called democratic. Uh, this is new. Uh, and like uh, many, uh, well, I would have to say most things in this evolving universe, there's an em emergent quality. In other words, it's never really been before. Uh, democracy um, and democratic communities on a large scale, uh, they, there have been small communities like this. Um, and of course, there are many histories of this and we could go into that. But okay, um, coming around to, uh, I think you and I want to go with this, Susan, um, Esalen, you know, why did we start Esalen? What was the vision that uh, inspired me to do it? And uh, Dick Price joined me in this. So 1950, 1961, when we got underway, that's 59 years ago, uh, the vision was to um, explore what uh, we saw as a greater life and a greater human nature pressing to be born in us. Uh, it's, we can say it that simply. Uh, now, we can put fancy names, theological frames, philosophic frames around uh, the way we see we saw then, and I see now, the world. That uh, we can use words, like a divine potential. Uh, uh, we can make it very fancy. But down to earth, it's that humans today know that there's more life to be had. We live only part of the life we are given. Uh, okay. But to have a place where we were going to explore uh, with this framework, um, we the idea was to invite thinkers and um, uh, spiritual teachers, psychologists, people from many fields together into a place for an ongoing conversation and for uh, ongoing experiments in transformative practice, okay? Um, that was the idea, and we started to do it. But we also knew that um, to get along, both Dick Price and I had been vaccinated against a cult. That communities that form often to uh, explore this greater life we feel inside us. These can be religious, uh, they can be more psychologically oriented, however they're framed. Um, there is a uh, abiding human impulse to get everyone else on board with us. And so willy-nilly in communities like this, you can have a Game of Thrones, uh, you know. Uh, in other words, who's gonna take over? Uh, you can have the guru wars. 
paradigm wars. So we went in and taking a vow that no one was going to capture the flag. Okay. So we had to learn how to negotiate this tension between a uh, life-giving, basically harmonious community uh, into which people were coming and leaving with experiments going on in personal growth and personal development. Now, I've, I'm sure everybody listening to this uh, knows enough about the various programs for growth that are going on now all over the world uh, under whatever flag. So, okay, I think, Susan, this is a long leap, but the problems we've had at Esalen uh, are reflected in the problems, say, I can say in the United States today between different visions of uh, <laughs> what America is and uh, how it should go forward. Uh, we see it in the polarization of the two parties. Uh, we see it in one movement after another, Come whether it's the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter movement, the uh, rise of indigenous American cultures, Native, Native American uh, cultures, and et cetera. And um, Esalen has become a house of causes with one cause after another coming through. And okay, so one of the problems uh, is that you will have very bright, totally well-meaning, idealistic, passionate people disagreeing about what comes first, their cause or this other person's cause. And all of this is um, um, part of the uh, growth of individuation, the, um, this growing skepticism about claims of how one ought to do things. Um, Freud uh, you know, talked about the, the superego and the id. Uh, Fritz Perls, who was at Esalen, framed it in terms of what he called the top dog and the underdog in every human nature. Um, how much do we allow ourselves to experience? Um, should we take LSD? Um, uh, should we stay married or not married? Um, we had um, intelligence officers from both Russia and America meeting. Now you can only imagine what should we say to one another? I mean, it's a risk just being together. And now to say this or to say that and go back to your bosses and think you're being turned. This incredible wrestling match between the personal and the communal um, is fully underway right now in the wide world, um, in some places more intense than others. So that's, Susan, I mean, I, I, that's, I hope that's not too long an answer, but um, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yes, you know, it's, it really is the challenge we're facing as a, um, as a species on this planet. Yes. As spiritual beings embodied uh, yes. to, to have reached this process of, of individuation and now hopefully strongly enough in that Yes. Consciousness, we can turn back toward the fact that we are in this together, that we impact yes. everyone else's reality. And we must also take responsibility for our own actions in terms of how that impacts other people. Yes. And, uh, you know, Henry Kissinger, the you know former American Secretary of State and um, so forth, talking about Russia and America, that we're doomed to coexistence. <laughs> You know, it's like uh, a bad marriage, but we're, we have, we're married mm -hmm. for better or worse until death do us part, mm -hmm. America and Russia. It's still yeah. unsettled. So the same with these different causes. Um, every one of these causes that uh, is arising today has justice behind it. Uh, and we has to be dealt with. But just to accommodate a variety of causes, you know, that's been a, a particular problem at Esalen because of the, um, you know, this, uh, <laughs> this um, 
uh, idea we had. It was ambitious um, and we still maintain. But I just want to say one more thing just that could maybe catalyze our talk here. Uh, one of the um, main ways through our dilemma in this regard, I feel, um, it can be caught in this uh, phrase that um, to, to finally find our common ground, um, we can find it on higher ground. Um, that this is where the spiritual dimension comes in. It, uh, and this is what I, I totally believe. We are more than our genes. We have genes, you know, we have a genetic structure. But uh, there is something in us that we have to call a soul or a, an inner life, a depth of subjectivity uh, that will not be squelched. And when it's when anybody tries to squelch it, um, you know, it it has uh, violent reactions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as someone said it it turns either to suicide or to murder. Mm -hmm. uh, it can get to that point. Let's say in a close thing, either you're going to kill yourself or the other. This kind of uh, criticism comes up, but there are countless ways to find uh, our basic deep down solidarity solidarity and uh, i would say the general attitude in the um in the world all of us share is there's a deeper um reality mm -hmm. call it a divinity um if you're a buddhist you might not li like that language but a, a deeper something mm -hmm. in which we are one another uh, and the, um, uh, I mean, the world is founded in a marriage of freedom and love. Now, very often in relationships, whether it's between countries or between uh, businesses or between working groups or in a marriage or whatever, you know, that conflict between freedom and love. The Teilhard de Chardin often use that, or um, uh, is uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. And of course, it, this um, these conflicts can be framed in different ways. Um, you know, the struggle between freedom and order, um, and uh, the, um, the tension between, um, uh, democracy and the need for leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, everybody one vote, but you have to have leadership in certain situations. All these tensions, um, uh, I think, are facilitated by the idea that we can find common ground on a higher ground or deeper ground, however you want to say it. Anyway. <laughs> no, that's that's perfect. I think Mitch has a question for you, but I'm going to, uh, we have a request from Stephen. Michael, because um, he likes to frame um, people when they're speaking. And if you can maintain a, a just a, maybe uh, distance yourself a little bit from the computer, it gets to be, that's better. Okay. And you can move okay. a little bit closer, but yeah, that's perfect. Okay. All right, I'm gonna pass it over to Mitch. Thank you. Well, uh, well, a great, great answer, Michael, and, and great comments. Um, and as you guys were going back and forth there, I was just thinking that, <sighs> maybe it's a unification of this idea of community and the self, because obviously both of those aspects of us are part of our evolutionary history and part of our evolutionary um, expansion. But how do we unify those two things together? And that was just kind of a thought that I had as you guys were chatting there, but um, I, I'm extremely inspired by, by your vision for Eslan and intrigued by the history that's come out of it and the adaptability that Eslan has had to, to stay relevant in different times uh, throughout its history. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. Um, I think you even called it the seasons of Eslan, which just summed it up very nicely. I yeah. wonder if there's a particular thing that you could put your finger on. I'm sure there are many that you have learned from your time doing this um, work and at Esalon that we can apply to today. Um, I think you were just touching on a big part of that, what you were saying to Susan's, but is there a particular thing that you've learned that you could kind of put a finger on that we might try to look at and say, hey, this is something we could work with or that might 
give us some inspiration going forward? Well, there are, um, gosh, there's so many, um, so many things uh, we've learned, and I, I certainly have um, right now, you know, kind of being um, in semi-quarantine with this COVID and all, it's, um, I want to say something like, well, perseverance furthers um, patience. Um, the, um, uh, and with that, for me, um, that uh, the, the ever recurrent idea of, of grace, mm -hmm. graces are given. If we persevere, our graces are given. Um, and, um, but anyway, um, you know, I, I, there, there are a lot of things I've learned along the way. I, um, um, one of the enduring um, learnings for me over these 59 years of Esalen um, um, is um, how well this basic vision that we started with and that inspired me has worked. Uh, the very idea um, um, that the um, universe, and this I, um, this is what I came into Esalen with, the universe is a evolutionary unfolding of its own implicit divinity. And um, this was at the heart of Sri Aurobindo's vision. He was my first most determinative or most influential uh, teacher, the Indian philosopher who, um, at whose ashram I spent a year and a half in my twenties. Um, and he had been um, an Indian uh, independence leader um, and had been educated in England, um, knew 12 languages, uh, you know, he, um, and then had these uh, big mystical re revelations and became a spiritual teacher and a philosopher. And his worldview uh, is uh, what uh, uh, inspired me. And at its core, it was that the, um, the divine gave birth to the cosmos that we know, to this universe. Uh, and now we know it was born in this big bang and it's been evolving for now the scientists feel 13, 13.8 billion years. And the divinity that's latent in it slowly manifests in the course of time. Uh, Schelling, the German philosopher, you know, um, and the German idealists uh, generally, starting in the 1790s, would say that the Deus implicitus in all matter, in the course of time, through evolution, becomes the Deus explicitus. All right. That idea, however you name it, um, uh, has been extraordinarily fertile um, for me, for us at Esalen. How? How has it been fertile? Well, first, we've invited, um, you know, hundreds of teachers. We've actually conducted more than 30,000 conferences and seminars over the 50 years, probably um, entertained uh, a greater variety of transformative practices than any other place. I mean, this, you know, we haven't thoroughly researched it, but <clears throat> most people would agree that that's the case. So we've had a privileged window into the fertility of this basic idea that you can explore transformational possibilities. And uh, you see the immense variety of um, people, different types of people uh, from around the world. Uh, we've had people, of, uh, we have a specific 120 countries have, have been to Esla. Um Typically about a quarter of the people there will be from outside the United States. So there's been this immense diversity of people, of races, of temperaments. Uh, and yet um, you can find commonalities. So this, uh, um, has been enormously reinforcing to us, encouraging uh, to keep us going. Um, so I want, I guess the biggest takeaway is the, 
it was a good idea to, to start it. And um, we used to, you know, uh, people would say, well, what is your lineage, you know? And I always resisted. In the old days, I would resist it because when you name something, there's a danger of trapping it. Uh, it you put it, your mind in a cage and you say, all right, this is it. But uh, so we simply called it the big vision. So people would say, well, what is it? <laughs> you know. So I would uh, talk and uh, describe it. Uh, but anyway, I started to um, experiment with names. And for a while, it was evolutionary Neoplatonism. Now, anybody who knows Neoplatonism, the uh, doctrine that the divine, the one, emanates into the world and the world or the soul whether the world, but particularly it was the individual soul, returns to the divine. So, Prohodos, you go forth from the one, and then Epistrophe, you return to the one in ecstasy. All right. Now, to put that in an evolutionary frame, because when Neoplatonism um, appeared, you know, um, around the, the time of, um, well, the, the, the third century um, AD, um, BCE with Plotinus. Um, okay, uh, they didn't know about the, the universe and all. So now to update it, pretty soon people said, well, no one knew <laughs> when I would use this phrase, well, what is Neoplatonism? So eventually we came to, I came to use the term uh, panentheism, uh, the doctrine that the divine is both transcendent to and imminent in every atom. So that worldview of panentheism has been around since the Vedic hymns. It's there in the Vedas of India and in the Upanishads. You know, um, uh, that moves and that moves not. That is far and the same is near. That is within all this. That outs is also outside all this. One, unmoving, that is swifter than mind. That the gods catch... Uh, reach not for it passes ever in front. That standing passes others as they run. All right, this is the issue of Upanishad, which is um, probably Aurobindo's favorite Upanishad, also was Gandhi's. Um, so panentheism, and that name is uh, generally, that term is generally used in um, theology and um, much speculative philosophy. So we can talk about this as evolutionary panentheism. In other words, you can give it a broad name, as long as we realize that this is um, orients us in many ways, and I've written about this, uh, many people have, it gives you a lot. It gives you a lot. And uh, so my biggest takeaway, I think if I look back over uh, these 59 years of Esalen, that it was a good idea to do this. Difficult. It's been a bumpy road. Um, and then the second thing, it's really given us um, is a window on how this greater life is popping up in places that the world is still hasn't caught up with. Um, Arabindo, uh, my teacher said, well, God will grow up while the wise men talk and sleep. Uh, it's appearing in all sorts of places. And I've had a particular um, uh, gift of um, 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 the first book I wrote, God knows how I did it or why. Um, my um, idea uh, was about golf, the game of golf, golf in the kingdom. And it was a, um, a tall Irish tale about the um, meeting a guru on a golf course. Well, that book for 49 years now has uh, not only opened up the fact that people are having mystical experiences on golf courses all over the place, but the world of sport. And um, sport fascinates the world. People love sport. But uh, experiences are happening out there, we've learned, that have uh, yet to be fully understood by the athletes themselves, their coaches, their sports psychologists, whatever. They do things they you know those of us who've read harry potter um wizards emerge on the playing fields but then 
after the game's over, we settle back into our mugglehood. We're muggles again. And so anyway, we, this is, I've been um, collecting stories of super normal events on sporting fields and been writing about it. And um, at Esalen now we're thinking up new ways to approach this. But uh, that same insight, if it's happening in the world of sport and not being perceived, where else? And uh, so I, my big book, The Future of the Body, I, you know, I laid out um, ways to perceive this um, in countless fields of human endeavor, glimpses of the supernormal. And um, so again, this basic worldview that uh, this greater life is pressing to be born in us, it's already in us. We are secretly divine but the emergence of it in the course of time, uh, we haven't fully caught up with this yet. And uh, it's happening, it's hiding in plain sight, largely. So how to identify it, cultivate it, go with it, um, get with the program, you say. Um, I, I'm sorry to take so long to say it, but that, 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 that would be my main, uh, if I had to just say one thing that I've learned, it's been this confirmation that um, we found a good way to go and uh, so to keep going. I love you know, it. We just I, keep yeah. going. I don't think it was too much. In fact, I think the fact that you've covered everything from Harry Potter to sports to Indian <laughs> gurus is absolutely fabulous and a beautiful <laughs> summation of what the human experience can be. Oh. So um, I'm curious, Matt, I'm curious if you have any questions from our audience that we might uh, ask Michael. Yes, we do. We have a question from someone named Vipper who seems to have read a book you wrote. He said, did Castaneda's writings influence you to develop the Shiva's Irons character in golf? Thank you. <laughs> that, you know, that's an uncanny and brilliant question. Um, I um, no, um, it, it didn't um, inspire me to, to do the book because I'd had this idea for this book. Um, that's another story. Before I read Carlos, I actually met Carlos. He came to Esalen in 1964 with Michael Harner, uh, and um, he was still a graduate student at UCLA. And Carlos, uh, it was there in an extraordinary gathering, Fritz Perls, um, uh, Bessie Parrish, who was a famous shaman, um, uh, is a Pomo Indian, um, quite, a, quite a collection. And Carlos stole the show. Um, he had a tremendous bundle of personality, um, and he told us the stories that later appeared in his book, um, um, his first book on Don Juan. This is 1964. Um, then uh, I didn't see him again. In 1969, he came up with a copy of this book um, that he had written. Um, uh, and then he became almost overnight of world famous. Um, and um, finally, I um, read the book, but I read the book um, after I had started writing Golf in the Kingdom. So that's a, that's a very interesting question that he would have asked that um, um, because uh, it resonated. It resonated. That book resonated with me. It didn't uh, inspire the, the book and all, but I'll tell you, there was one specific um, uh, item in uh, Carlos's first book, um, this idea that at times you can perceive streamers of energy uh, with your subtle sight, your third eye, that accompany certain vectors of force. Um, and yes, I did put that in Golf in the Kingdom. I've never told anybody this. And I, I took that from Carlos, that one um, occult item. Well, wouldn't you know, dozens, dozens of uh, people playing golf have written to me or let me know one way or another that they had seen these things before they read about it in Golf in the Kingdom. 
And, you know, this is where we, um, in our wizard lives, learn from one another. We get little glimpses of how the world secretly works. Uh, I got that clue from, from Carlos. You know, I've never told anybody this. This is curious. <laughs> but I didn't have the inspiration for it. And there were many other um, experiences in there that um, <coughs> I had this fictitious character, um, Shiva Sirens. Um, and to my astonishment, uh, uh, I've been hearing reports of this from everywhere. And, you know, it, it busts a lot of prejudice prejudices uh, some of us have about the game of golf that, um, you know, and we can, um, Esalen's, uh, let's say most of the people coming to Esalen are very to the left, liberal. And um, I, I, I suppose Esalen's 80% Democrats that came. We never ask anybody, but so um, there's a kind of snobbishness about um, these uh, Republicans, you know, they're so square. So people say, well, golf. And I say, well, I, I discovered that uh, golf is a mystery school for Republicans. It's um, the, um, I mean, they're all having these experiences. Um, so, um, you know, um, the super normal aspects of our nature is very, are very democratic. Uh, people from every political party have them. Um, the um, people from every culture, but then they get expressed and um, discovered uh, in very different ways. So uh, that's whoever asked that question. It's uncanny that they came up with that. Anyway, I think it's great. We have some amazing people out there that that tune in regularly, and, and I'd like to pretty know tuned they, on people. How they came up with that? I, I would uh, be interesting to know. Absolutely. Well, and I think you just came up with the second book, right? So we could say the mystery school for, for Republicans. And I think that would be a follow-up maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Matt, are there any other questions out there? And thank you for the last question, by the way. Yes. We've got another question from Tristan. Is alchemy currently practiced? And if so, how? Well, well, alchemy, uh, as it was practiced, say, um, way back when, even by Isaac Newton, you know, um, the greatest scientist of the age, uh, uh, was um, really did um, mainly involve the idea you could turn lead into gold. Um, then um, there has been in the last couple of centuries uh, a belief that this was all um, a kind of cover or maybe a symbol of or a, of, uh, of an inner work um, uh, of, of turning uh, what is um, wrong in us into what is higher and more beautiful. Um, so um, in that metaphoric sense, alchemy, if you, if you think uh, metaphorically, uh, you can use that metaphor uh, in to describe what's going on in all sorts of transformative practices. Um, but the old fashioned idea of alchemy, you know, is now dead as a doornail. It's um, it didn't work. Nobody ever could turn lead into gold. Um, I mean, that's a very simple way to say it. Um, but um, so as long as we see that as a metaphor, um, uh, transforming this, uh, I would say the flesh itself. Uh, my teacher, Arbindo, really strongly oriented us into this. Um, he, he didn't describe himself as this, but it's, it was, it's very basically very tantric. Those of you who know um, what the tantra is. Um, and um, Esalen, although we didn't fly under that flag, <clears throat> was tantric in the sense that tantra emphasizes the divine imminence, that uh, this secret divinity is in everywhere, everything, and it can be <clears throat> transformed, sublimated into, <clears throat> into um, uh, we can sublimate all our activities 
into uh, higher expressions. And, and that's one way to look at what's happening in sport. 99% uh, of the people who are playing football in America, American football, that's a rough sport. Um, but um, they are playing it, they would say, for the thrill of it, the fun of it, the adventure, the, uh, the, the joy they feel. Uh, there may be other motives too, but as a kid, um, uh, but what happens now, uh, and I'm finding this out more and more, <clears throat> talking to athletes all the time <clears throat> who are tuning in to these secrets of transformation that occur if you're in the right state of mind and you have the right belief system. So um, sport is a particular uh, venue for um, this sublimation, this, this alchemy, if you will. And by God, I tell you, um, um, there are many, many books to be written now on how the body, the physical body itself can morph. Uh, we know this from all the evidence of spiritual healing. Uh, we know it for uh, the, the, these mind-body um, practices that have emerged over the, particularly over the last 50 or 60 years, all, all around the world, um, to um, mind over matter. Um, uh, there's a lot of superstition and foolishness in all of this, but there's also uh, real work being done so that um, the most material part of our being um, can change to some extent. It depends on our commitment, our practice, um, and the graces that are given uh, to um, help us develop that. We know, of course, I mean, every religious tradition will say we can change our, our feelings and our, we can change our mind, but we can change our body too. So, um, I do think that um, one of the reasons the idea of alchemy has been so popular um, in uh, contemporary years and decades, certainly we can see this at Esalen, um, is this orientation towards uh, matter itself as we directly experience it in our own flesh, in our own bodies. Um, so, um, Anyway, that, that, that's some things to say about. No, that's alchemy. great. And I, thank you for making the, dif, uh, you know, differentiating between the uh, kind of the two modalities of looking at that, because I think sometimes they can get confused. But uh, Matt, I think we have one last question, I believe, before we wrap up. Is that correct? That's right. OK. Um, we've got a question from Bucky. Does our subconscious bounce from life to life? I think he about reincarnation and maybe yeah. past lives and future lives. Maybe just see what's your view on that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, I, um, uh, personally, I have to start, uh, with my own attitude toward this, uh, from the day I heard that Atman is Brahman from a teacher at Stanford when I was 19. And even before that, um, uh, I, uh, have become more and more anchored in um, the truth that our deepest subjectivity is one with the divine. I and I, I, I it would be wrong for me to say I believe it. I, I have to say I know it. Um, I've practiced meditation enough to know that as you practice this, this becomes truer and truer and truer. That I know is true. All right. Reincarnation, um, I don't know it with that degree of certitude, but, but um, there is a huge, huge, huge witness to it as a fact. And um, knowing that, uh, we started a program in 98 at Esalen, a 13 year fellowship to gather together all the evidence that we could find all over the world for reincarnation. And now uh, two big books have come out of that, <clears throat> countless articles, um, uh, 
this would be a, a whole other program. And I've become, um, I've gone from saying being tilted 60% over to about 90% that it's a fact. Okay. My teacher Arabindo believes it was a fact. Many people are, and they speak with absolute, they would say it's, they know it as a fact. I haven't quite crossed in there, but I'm close. Okay, what do we know? Our facts. Well, um, at the University of Virginia, <clears throat> Ian Stevenson, the famous uh, uh, explorer of this, um, assembled 2,600 case studies of children who remember, who say they remember a past life. And then Stevenson for 50 years went out to see how much of their testimony could be confirmed that there was such a life. Well, I invite anybody to read this magnificent literature, uh, Ian Stevenson, S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N, Ian Stevenson. And you can read these case histories about reincarnation. Okay, now back to this question, the subconscious. Um, I, I don't know, something like one third of these cases that they collected involved bodily um, stigmata, marks on the, on the child or uh, deformities, um, missing a finger or something that the child uh, attributed to some sort of violence uh, or violent event in, a, in, in the previous life. So you can go through this literature. Um, it's available. You go to Amazon and start searching for these books, Ian Stevenson. And, and look at these hundreds of photographs of um, these marks or wounds or deformities in these kids and then compare them to photographs they found uh, of somebody who did live in a previous life and who had had, say, their finger shot off in a gun, um, uh, by a gun. Uh, one kid was born with um, seven of these um, purpura, you know, these marks, uh, birthmarks, uh, running from uh, one shoulder down to the waist, seven of these and said he'd been machine gunned. He was a Turkish child, uh, machine gunned. He'd been hit by bullets. And so by God, they found photographs of someone who fit the description of this kid and, the, and, and, and was machine gunned this way. You see what I'm saying? All right, you, if you start at some point for me in reading all this, my belief tipped, okay. So that's for starters. Now the subconscious, um, this, uh, you have to believe that um, there's a, well, there's obviously, it's a fact that these children have a subconscious from which these images are rising, if that's what you mean by a subconscious, and that um, they are operative. And um, there are probably millions of people today in the world who have uh, vague remembrances of some things, something that are, that's haunting them, guiding them, prompting them, um, nudging us forward, uh, around which you can weave a belief system that you, it, it's a continuation of something in a past life. Now, one other thing to say is that it's another curious fact that, that um, among these 2,600 case studies, um, um, uh, these kids with these uh, bodily marks and uh, often deformities um, remember a life that was not many years before. Now, this is really interesting. That they would, in other words, it was a short inter intermediate state. So you could. Okay, some of the thinkers that at Esalen who have gathered on this use language like, well, maybe they're, they didn't have as deep a death as you should have or that others have. In other words, they're carrying an immediate 
trauma uh, over to the to a next life, and and they're still struggling with it so vividly. They impress it somehow in the embryo. <laughs> I say this is it really stretches the imagination, and it busts our current scientific paradigms wide open. And that's why most scientists would say this is advanced woo woo, you know. But okay, maybe this somehow happens. In other words, so the data compels us to speculate about how it works. And um, now in at Esalen and in, in the main world we inhabit, we go into this with open minds. We're not um, committed to say a particular, say a Tibetan doctrine, that this is exactly the way it works. Maybe they're right. Maybe this particular school of Buddhist thought, to, the Tibetans, you know, are very heavily into reincarnation. So there's a lot of lore there. Um, some of the Buddhist schools don't believe in it. Uh, some of the Zen schools, some of my close friends who are Buddhist, I uh, don't don't think it works this way. But the Tibetans, okay, they. Um, so you can go and and look at that and and see what is thought because that, there's a culture that's been open to this, and I think it's one of the great um, enterprises facing us today is a deeper exploration into what's going on. How does this work? And um, so we've got a foothold in it, and it's one of our commitments going forward at Esalen to uh, continue on in this, and uh, we're coming up with ways to um, go after it. Um, but um, that's part of the great challenge today, is we're standing on the edge of a breakout into a, a major new set of initiatives. Um, that's the most exciting part of uh, my life now, and um, I think of uh, I think more and more people are going to wake up to this. We're on the edge of it would be some somewhere maybe like in the beginning of the Renaissance or uh, maybe around 1500 or 1400. I, you know, I look for these parallels in history. We're at a, we're at a breakout moment, um, but it's going to demand a tremendous change in the scientific paradigms. I mean, we have to get past these materialistic reductionism and so forth. Anyway. Those. Wonderful. No, and well said there. I think that's, uh, yeah, standing on the edge of this brand new state of being, oh, uh, yeah. which is going to be much more complex, but we can all kind of, I think people are starting to sense it and sense yeah. it in some very dramatic ways. I would, so. I, I would bet everything I have 50 years from now, uh, it's going to be a blow wide open. Um, oh, yeah. It, it would be like, you know, history, um, like every learning curve, you know, every learning curve is an S curve. You know, you learn that in psychology 1A and any university <laughs> psychology course. So you're on a long plateau and then it S's up, say learning a motor skill, playing the violin, whatever it is. But history, you know, go through these long periods and then you'll have this explosive break mm -hmm. up into the new. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're on the edge of a new one. I, mm -hmm. I, you can predict it. You can feel it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we're privileged at Essen because we had this... Um, you know, this crazy experiment we've been involved in for 58 years now. And um, uh, not only are, you know, we're, we're doomed to uh, go off the cliff one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> um, Literally and fi figuratively, is that? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, we're living on the cliff edge there. And um, and I think it's on the, um, on the edge of a, a breakout mm -hmm. in culture around these, right on these kinds of issues. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. I find that very hopeful and uh, and very exciting. And Michael, I'm just I have to say over the course of this uh, Q and A conversation with you and the conversation we had prior before we coming on, I'm just so impressed with your scope of knowledge and um, so appreciative for your willingness to share it with us. Uh, I feel like I would, if you were teaching a course, I'd sign up in a heartbeat. <laughs> uh, and I just gave Golf in the Kingdom to my son and oh. translated into French for my French husband because um, oh, they're both goodness. golfers. Yeah, you know, so my I goodness. just, yeah. And, and it's so um, inspiring also to see someone uh, who's still so passionate about mm. learning and evolving and sharing yeah. what you know. It's, uh, I'm very inspired, I have to say. Well, it's good to be with you, Susan, and thank you all, um, uh, Stephen and um, 
all of you guys. Yeah, and, and Matt, Matt, wherever Matt is, I just see <laughs> he's disembodied. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Thank he's, you. He's there, and I. Um, anyway, so I want to say too that we had a, a brief conversation prior to going live today, where Brigitta and Stan Groff joined us and were in conversation with Michael. And um, at some point in the future, we hope to uh, edit together some of that conversation to share with you. It was such a delight. So many wonderful stories. Um, technologically, we just couldn't pull it together to tack, <laughs> tack it on to the end of this, but um, it's well worth sharing. And um, many, many thanks, Michael. Much love to you. Absolutely. Well, wonderful yeah. to be with you. Wonderful. And I, I'm going to invite you to stay with us while we close out so that you can say hi to Stan and Brigitte who have been um, listening in our Zoom hey, meeting, but, but invisibly. We'll, we'll take right. you out of the spotlight and, uh, you know, we can just have a little more casual conversation yeah. now. So the okay. interrogation is over. On? You want me to stay on here? <laughs> yes, please do. Great. So goodbye, thank, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Yeah.